Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry, presents Francis Langford, June Lockhart, and Tony Romano in G.I. Valentine. Most of the products recently developed by chemists are doing war jobs now. There is one new discovery, however, that is available to help you keep your home bright and cheerful. It is Speed Easy, the new DuPont wall finish that so many people are using to paint over faded, soiled wallpaper. DuPont Speed Easy covers in one coat. It dries in an hour. It comes in eight attractive colors. And DuPont Speedy is inexpensive, too. You can do over an average room for less than $3. Tonight, February 14th, Cavalcade delivers a valentine to the home front from the hearts of our servicemen and women overseas. The bearer of this valentine is Francis Langford, who has recently returned from a 50,000-mile entertainment tour through the theaters of war. Francis Langford, with Bob Hope, Tony Romano, and other great troopers, carried song and laughter to more than five million of our men and women on fighting fronts from the Aleutians to Sicily. Assisted by Tony Romano and his indispensable guitar, and with June Lockhart as a pilot sweetheart, Miss Langford gives us an account, written by Frank Gabrielson, the highlights of those 50,000 miles of singing through the war, telling us particularly of American women at war, of the wax, the Red Cross workers, and the gallant army nurses. DuPont presents G.I. Valentine, starring Francis Langford with Tony Romano and June Lockhart on The Cavalcade of America. That was Please Don't Cry, Ladies and Gentlemen, by Private James Tomaselli. And I sang it for Jimmy's Girl as a kind of valentine from him. He brought the song to me one day after a show we gave in an American camp somewhere in England. I tell you, Francis, my girl at home worries about me and about the war. So I've been trying to write a letter explaining the war and, and how I'm okay and all. But you can't say much about war that's good. Even this one, that we know we got to fight. Anyway, I can't say anything she can't read better in the papers. I guess what I really want to say to her is that I love her. And not to worry about me, because I'm coming back to her. If I can. But I can't write it like I feel it. So seeing music used to be my hobby. I wrote a song to tell her what I feel. Would you sing it sometime, Francis, when she could hear it? Dear, just remember... You shouldn't feel so blue There are so many others Who feel the way you do I won't say when But we'll meet again Now, let's go back to the summer of 1942 and a phone call. Hello. Miss Langford? Yes. Uh, This is the USO Camp Shows. We'd like you and Bob Hope to make a tour of bases in Alaska and the Aleutians. What do you say? (laughs) What would any woman say? I'd love it. But what do I wear? On your forthcoming trip for the purpose of building morale in the armed forces... You're advised to take a fur coat, slacks, heavy sweaters, woolen socks, and woolen underwear. 
If desired, one heavy, practical, warm wool dress may be taken. So that was the wardrobe I took. And the first night we were in Alaska, we were asked to a party at the officers' club in Fairbanks. They wore their uniforms, and I was the glamour girl who was supposed to uplift morale. I felt like Cinderella at five after 12. Seriously, though, it was wonderful to see those girls in their neat dress uniforms. That same afternoon, I'd seen them working endlessly in their wards. But tonight... You see, Francis, we work quite hard, and we don't get much chance to remember life like it was. And we hope it's going to be again. So when we get an excuse like this dance, well, we go all out feminine. Personally, I'm in this war so I can call my lipstick as well as my soul my own. That nurse was up before light the next morning and worked all day at the hospital. Besides her regular duties, she assisted at an emergency operation. She wrote four letters home for wounded men. She kidded constantly with the men in the convalescent ward and lighted several cigarettes for a bombardier from the Aleutians, who had lost both arms. She went to bed that night dead tired, considering it an average day. I don't think anybody's going to get her lipstick, and I know nobody will ever get her soul. We were in Alaska about a week, flying to as many camps as we could. We played to audiences of thousands, and we played to little groups of bearded men at out-of-the-way landing fields hacked out of the forest. In some of these places, the men hadn't seen a woman in over a year. From Alaska, we flew to the Aleutians, to Naknek, Coal Bay, past Dutch Harbor, on out to Umnak. At Umnak, they told me I was the first white woman ever on the island, and everyone began calling me the Virginia Dare of Umnak. There wasn't a building large enough to hold all the men, so we gave our show outdoors in the pouring rain. They had built a kind of stage for us, but naturally there were no seats. The men and the officers just squatted down in the mud to watch us. And what an audience they were. You made me sigh for I didn't want to tell you I didn't want to tell you I want some love That's true Yes, I do Indeed, I do You know I do Give me, give me, give me what I cry for. You know you got the brand of kisses that I die for. You know you made me love you. Tony. That kid there, he's crying so. Homesick, probably. Bring him around afterwards, huh, Tony? Okay, let's take it again. A one, a two. You may... Oh, congratulations, Miss Langford. A great show. (laughs) Thanks, Colonel. I hope the boys liked it. Liked it? They loved it. (laughs) Francis, Francis, can I see you a minute? Yes, Tony. Will you excuse me a minute, gentlemen? Why, certainly, Miss Langford. Yes, gentlemen. I found the the kid you wanted to see, Francis. Oh, good. Fanny, this is uh, Eddie Riggs. Hello, Eddie. How do, ma'am? You better call me Francis. Ma'am really makes me feel like Virginia Dare. Yes, ma'am. You're in the Air Force, I see. Well, um, meteorology. We take care of the weather. You must have your hands full up here. This rain. 261, six tenths inches a year. Is it interesting work? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Francis. <laughs> Say, where are you from, Eddie? Chinook, Kansas. You know, I'll probably be in Kansas this winter. We play camps all over the country at home, you know. Say, would you like me to call up your folks and tell them I saw you? Oh, that'd be a bother for oh, you. Oh, no. I'm making calls for a lot of the boys. Well, if you really could, it'd be fine. Just look in the Chanute phone book. Numbers under Dr. George Riggs and ask for Ma. Uh, Mrs. Riggs, I mean. I certainly will, Eddie. And I'm sorry my song upset you. Oh, I, I liked your song, honestly. What were you crying about? Sorry you noticed. Didn't think anybody would, Moraine. 
Anything wrong at home, Eddie? No, everybody's fine. Otherwise, I'd have uh, got a letter from Ma. Of course, she's pretty busy, so she doesn't write much unless something special's happened. Of course, Pa hasn't got time to write his prescriptions, hardly. When I call your mother, Eddie, shall I tell her you might like a letter, even if there isn't much to say? Just say you saw me. I think a lot about home. That wasn't why I was crying. Why, then? Well, I guess it's just the idea of you folks coming all this way to... Make us laugh and feel better. It's great to know people at home haven't forgotten all about us. Last June, we started out again, this time for England. Bob and Tony and I. We were there six or seven weeks giving shows at American camps all over the British Isles. For the first time, I had the sense of seeing a whole country at war. For every shortage we have at home, the English have a dozen. It's pretty hard to be complacent about a war when you've had it in your own backyard. And the English have. What I remember most vividly about England is the day we spent at one of the American air bases there. Before sunrise, we stood on the field and watched 45 fortresses take off on an undisclosed mission. We counted them out one by one as they moved down the runways and took the air. 45 went out how many would come back. That afternoon, we again stood beside the runways to wait for the returning planes and count them in. We weren't the only ones that waited. There were the ground crews. There were officers anxious to learn the results of the mission. There were a few wives and sweethearts waiting. And there was a row of ambulances, all waiting. Just before the scheduled time of return, the suspense gets almost unbearable. Everyone on the field gets it, too. Next to me was a girl in a Red Cross worker's outfit. She lit a cigarette, and I could see her hands shake. This waiting can be tough, huh? (laughs) Every time I come here, I swear it's the last time. I saw all 45 go out this morning. And you know, I have a hunch they're all 45 coming back. (laughs) Well, figure on a 5% loss, and you'll be about right. Two or three planes, probably. Say, you connected with this base? Only unofficially. I'm, I'm engaged to the navigator on the fortress Popeye. And the Popeye sounds unbeatable. Well, if they don't run out of spinach, meaning luck. Why is everybody so quiet all of a sudden? Well, they're just about due back, if nothing went wrong. Listen. And they were coming back, fortress after fortress. One, two, then five, then ten of them. Are any of those the Popeye? No. Then it was twenty of them, and twenty-five, and thirty. Is the Popeye here yet? Not yet. Then it was thirty-two, thirty-five, thirty-seven, thirty-eight. Are you positive the Popeye hasn't landed? Positive. Oh, look. Look, here comes 39 and 40. But that's not him. How can you tell from this distance? I know his plane. After number 40 hit the field, they seemed to stop coming. Oh, they can't have lost five. No, no, here's another, and one more behind it. That's 42. That's three lost. Well, that's not too bad. Is is his plane one of those two? I, I can't tell yet. Oh, wait. There are another two back of them. That's 44. Out of four, one is bound to be the Popeye. Well, it looks like they finally ran out of spinach. Oh, come on. I'm sure they'll make it. They'd have been here long ago. Anyway, they all don't come back. Well, thanks for waiting with me. Um... I'm sorry. Well, every trip, somebody's left looking at the empty sky. Why? Why, one out of 45 is a very good percentage of... Listen, do you hear something? Oh, it's the Popeye. They found their spinach.
The Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry, is bringing you Francis Langford with Tony Romano and June Lockhart in G.I. Valentine, a first-hand account of Miss Langford's travels on three continents to sing for our fighting men and women. She has told us how, with Bob Hope and Tony Romano, she visited our forces in Alaska, the Aleutians, and the British Isles. From England, they headed for North Africa, where Frances resumes her story. Africa was everything I expected, but more so. More heat, more sand, more strangeness. At our first show there, the temperature was something over 130 in the shade. But there wasn't any shade. After the show, we had about two hours before we left. I was tired and wanted to rest, so some wax station there took me to their barracks so I could have a nap. A nice, long nap. How long are dresses now? How about these ration points? Can you or can't you get nail polish? Well, dresses are about to... Here. Oh, can you get nail polish? Well, that's not too tough. But face tissue was murder, huh? Murder is right. You know, when I get out of this girl's army, I'm just going to a beauty parlor and stay. <laughs> Who's the big star of entertainment now, Francis? <laughs> Present company accepted. <laughs> well, I'd say Sinatra. Who? Frank Sinatra. What does he do? <laughs> Why, he's a singer. I never even heard of him. Oh, me neither. Uh, it shows you. Time goes by. Uh, Francis, why aren't more girls at home joining the WAC? Oh, do we have to talk shop? Well, I want to know. Why aren't they, Francis? Oh, pay no attention to Ryan, Francis. She thinks it's smart to gripe. She's only the best soldier in the outfit. What's tough about that? Why, last month she could have had leave home. She wouldn't take it. Well, why should I go where I can't get face tissue or bobby pins? That's too tough. <laughs> Don't let her kid you, Francis. She's crazy about the outfit. Say, Francis, you got a picture of yourself you can spare? Sure, Ryan. I'll autograph one for you. Oh, no, no. Uh, don't sign it. I'll do that. You'll sign my name on the picture? No, my own. I want to send it to a guy I'm corresponding with. Then it's somebody you've never met. Yeah. His lodge writes to whack. <laughs> <laughs> but what'll happen when you meet him? How is he going to like you signing my picture? Oh, he won't have any kick coming. You know what he sent me with his name on? A picture of your husband, John Hall. <laughs> <laughs> Say, what time you got? Oh, uh, ten past. Holy cow, I gotta write my letter. I'll see you after you had your nap, Francis. <laughs> you bet, soldier. <laughs> A real G.I. Josephine, that gal. Is she really going to write to that man? Oh, that's just for laughs. She's going to write her brother now. He's got a bum lung or something, so the army wouldn't take him. He feels kind of bad about it, so Ryan is always writing him. Her brother is why she joined up. She figured if he couldn't fight, that she should. Then Ryan really likes the rack, huh? She loves it. And if only they'd let us use guns, she'd be the happiest girl in the world. These three are strong, healthy women. Any war plant in America would pay them almost as much for a week as the Army pays them for a month. In this country, of course... They would have to face point rationing, gas rationing, shortages of non-essential goods, and the income tax. But they would be home and they would be safe. Instead, these girls, on their own free will, chose a job that brought them to blistering Africa and air raids and no extra pay for overtime. Private Ryan, even before you get to that beauty shop, you look mighty good to me. From Bizerta, we flew to Sicily, where in a single show we performed to 19,000 men. Our stage was a captured Nazi tank. One day in Sicily, we played a hospital show. And walking down the corridor, hey, on our way to the ward, we heard Latin coming from one of the small rooms. We credit in me etium si mortuus fueret vivet. It was a Catholic chaplain administering the last rites. But we went on to the ward and did our show, and the wounded men enjoyed it very much. In this same hospital the next day, a nurse walked by me carrying a tray. Here, let me help you. No, I'm all right. No. Sit over here. Thanks. I'll get a doctor. No, don't. Don't. I'll be all right in a minute. I'm going to get a doctor. No, please. Please. I just need to rest a minute. You need to lie down. And you need a doctor. No, wait, please. I, I don't want a doctor. What do you mean? I mean, they might send me home. 
Maybe they should send you home. No, no, it's nothing serious. Just that I... I guess I'm getting older. Please, let me get a doctor. No, no, look, Miss Langford. I'm a nurse. I've been a nurse for 25 years. I know what I need and what I don't. Oh, thanks for being worried, but... Nothing's going to happen to me. Give me a hand up, please. Well, at least you can rest a while. You're married, aren't you, girl? Yes, I am. So was I. My husband died in a French hospital in the last war. I don't know quite how he died, but maybe if he'd had a little better care, he wouldn't have. And if I sit here resting, well, what happened to my Fred might happen to some of these boys. I see what you mean. I talked with one kid in the ward who'd only been married a month before he came overseas. A month? If Fred and I were married just the day before he sailed for France. Nurse. Nurse. Coming. But of everything I saw and did, what moved me most happened not once, but every day, in every camp, at five o'clock. Attention! The flag was lowered. And in the faces of men, you saw what this was. It was home. It was Main Street. It was why. Hey, go some resurrects you. No, that's not the Popeye. Nurse, nurse. Coming. Just tell Ma you saw me. So when we get the chance, we go all out feminine. She could have had leave and she wouldn't go. I guess what I really want to say is that I love her and that I'm coming back to her if I can. Please don't cry. DuPont Cavalcade thanks you, Francis Langford, June Lockhart, and Tony Romano for your report to us and appreciates the fine work you and all the entertainment world are doing to brighten the days of our fighting men. Miss Langford has something to add to her report and will return to the microphone in just a few moments. Meanwhile, here is Gain Whitman speaking for DuPont to tell us of an interesting chemical treatment for seeds that benefits us all, whether we are farmers or not. Eating, somebody has remarked, is a habit. It certainly is. And it isn't limited to any one country, either. The men and women and children of all nations have a firm, fixed habit of eating. So food must be grown for them to eat. And we've learned in this war that every extra ton of food we can produce is precious. Here is good news for the farmers of North and South America. And good news for all of us who eat what the farmers grow. Realizing their vital importance, this year enough mercury has been released to enable DuPont and other chemical companies to manufacture a full 1944 supply of mercuric seed treatment compounds for farmers. Whether you are a farmer or not, this affects you. 
It affects both the amount of food you will have in 1944 and the price you will pay for it. Take cotton, for instance. Cotton isn't a food crop? Oh, yes, it is. Cotton seed is every bit as important as cotton fiber because cotton seed is used in manufacturing many cooking oils and kitchen shortenings. Cotton farmers can plant their seed earlier, getting ahead of their dreaded enemy, the boll weevil, by using a seed disinfectant like DuPont Sirisan, which gives the seed a protective coating. This coating safeguards the seed even in cold, damp soil in the early spring and makes it unnecessary for farmers to replant their cotton several times when soil conditions are unfavorable. Seed costs money. So does fertilizer. So does labor. All of them, in wartime, are hard to find. Seed treatment, treating seed with chemicals before it is planted, usually means bigger crops of better quality. Wheat, corn, beans, potatoes, practically every food plant known has its own diseases, carried in many cases on the seeds themselves. If nothing is done to combat them, these diseases reduce the amount of marketable food produced per acre. Now there are available not only different mercury seed disinfectants, but also a new seed treatment which contains an organic product and no mercury. This is Arisan seed treatment. Arisan is an effective product for peanuts, corn, and certain vegetables. More and more farmers everywhere in the world are learning the value of seed treatment. So it's good news that in 1944, enough seed treating compounds to fill our needs will be available. Seed treating chemicals help to increase the United Nations wartime supply of food. Deserve honorable mention among DuPont's better things for better living through chemistry. And here is the star of tonight's cavalcade, Francis Langford. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, I told you about a time in England when I saw 45 planes go out and the same 45 planes return. That was last summer. Yesterday, I met an officer who was at that field that day. Of those 45 planes, two remain. Is it really so tough to buy that extra war bond? <laughs> Next week, on the eve of Washington's birthday, DuPont presents Guy Kibbe, Dick Foran, and Wendy Barry in The Purple Heart Comes to Free Meadows, the warmly inspiring story of a young sergeant just returned from the war and a New England village eager to honor the first village boy to win the Purple Heart. It's a dramatic story, too, of the significance and brave tradition of the original Purple Heart awarded by General Washington. Francis Langford appeared on Cavalcade tonight through the courtesy of RKO Pictures. June Lockhart appeared through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, whose current production is Madame Curie. This is James Bannon sending best wishes from Cavalcade sponsor, the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware, who invites you to join Cavalcade's audience next Monday when Guy Kibbe, Dick Foran, and Wendy Barry will be starred in The Purple Heart Comes to Free Meadows, a story of the Purple Heart and the brave tradition that surrounds it down to the present day. came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company.